Very good morning to you. My name is Lillian Muli and this is Citizen Extra. Supreme Court judges will this morning start a race against time hearing and determining three petitions filed in relation to the October 26th repeat presidential election. This is expected to happen in just six days. Now, unlike in August, where there was one petition, this time there are three, meaning more lawyers will be arguing out their cases under a strict Timeline. This is the second time in three months that the judges are being called upon to determine the validity of a presidential election. And we will be live at the Supreme Court where Sam Kituku is on standby. And we're crossing over there um, right away as we um, wait to, of course, hear um, what the proceedings will look like or, or see what the proceedings will look like um, as the day progresses. Sam Gituku is at the Supreme Court. I'll be talking to him very shortly. Laura Atieno is in Kisumu. There will be getting reactions on um, the Supreme Court starting its sittings today with only six days um, to determine um, the petitions before them. And, of course, we'll be getting reactions on the People's Assembly uh, there in Kisumu whether this is a solution as far as the people of Kisumu County are concerned and whether it will actually do more harm or good as far as the people there are concerned. We'll be talking to Laura. But for now, let's uh, hear from Sam Getoku, who is at the Supreme Court. Remember, the Supreme Court judges have only six days starting today. Sam Getoku, let's um, hear from you on what's happening there, who has made their way there, and when we're expecting the court to start its hearings. Well, good morning, Lillian. Yes, we're expecting the judges to be at the court at about 11 o'clock when they begin the process of uh, managing this case. And that is as far as the pre-trial conference is concerned. At the, pre at the pre-trial conference, as you will remember uh, from the previous petition, that is uh, the one that was uh, by Relo Dinga versus Uhuru Kenyatta as well as the IBC, the pre-trial conference uh, took uh, the first session in the morning uh, when the parties to the case were directed to go and agree on the contentious issues as well as the non-contentious issues that um, were to be determined by the judges but that was not possible even after the break that they were given they came back to the courtroom with no report of uh, an agreement of course through a meeting that was uh, over overseen by the register of the supreme court but later on the judges indicated that they were going to go ahead and each party were, were to uh, advance their issues but now this time round the pre-trial conference begins at about t 11 o'clock and the expectation is that uh, the judges the supreme court judges will be directing the parties on um, what modalities to take because they need to determine the matters of determination and we're talking about that you realize that um, the three petitions the first one by harun Mwao, who is saying that iebc was wrong for failing to conduct fresh nominations and they went ahead to uh, prepare for the fresh presidential election and then the other petition by john jomu as well as halef khalifa they are saying that um, there were so many inconsistencies that uh, were conducted by the iebc the, the environment was not conducive for a fresh presidential election they are saying that uh, iebc should have gone ahead to conduct fresh nominations nominations they should also not have ignored the boycott the withdrawal from the race by Ray Lodinga because you will remember uh, that uh, Ray Lodinga on the 10th of uh, October indicated that he was not interested in fo in, in following uh, the presidential election and so uh, they were saying that uh, the IABC should have respected that, but uh, IBC essentially uh, gave a response saying that uh, Ray Laudinga's withdrawal was not in accordance with the law. And so that is part of the con contestation by uh, these two uh, petitioners where they want the court to determine that that election should not have proceeded on uh, after that withdrawal. But um, so basically those uh, the several issues, of course, the other petition by uh, Kyoko Kilokumi who says that uh, uh, Ray Laudinga was wrong in, with withdrawing from the race. So we'll be expecting to hear from the judges as they direct, they direct the parties to this case how should they have proceeded how should they proceed on uh, to determine even the days of hearing but essentially if you remember from the other petition that was uh, in September in August uh, the said that uh, they were going to have two days of hearing at that time there were prayers to have the scrutiny the opening of servers uh, that were ha that had handled the results of that that election but now this time round we still be expecting to hear what more directions uh, should be happening but let me just take you through what is happening here at the Supreme Court because we're still a couple of hours away about two and a half hours before that that can begin uh, but uh, at the supreme court you have seen several uh, lawyers of the different parties that are in this case making their entrance but of course they will not be heard they will not be seen until that time uh, when the judges make their way into the courtroom that is the supreme
Supreme Court. Uh, but, but just to take you through uh, the other modalities that are, that are taking place, um, of course, the situation that was in August, there were several security officers. Now, today, we have seen security officers, but um, of course, the number is reduced. Maybe this, this is because of uh, the interest that the petition of August um, it attracted you realize William that uh, that petition was uh, by one of the presidential candidates and that is Raila Odinga as well as his running mate uh, Kalonzo Musioka now this time round it is uh, three individuals if I may co call them so because Harun Moore former member of parliament for Kilome then John John Mue and Halef Halifa uh, who Hel Halef Halifa uh, who are people who are members of the civil society as well as Kilokume, a lawyer uh, taking, taking part in this case. So uh, the kind of interest that was attracted that time is not present this time round. We've not seen uh, several supporters from each of the parties uh, from either of the parties, that the Jubilee Party as well as the National Super Alliance. Uh, maybe this indicates something, but we'll be expecting to hear uh, and see how this pans out. But that does not stop the police from barricading the roads because you can see that this road, City Hall Way that goes all the way to, uh, jun to the junction of the uh, Parliament Road is barricaded uh, from the extent of uh, just next to the entrance to the KICC. So no person, if you don't have the accreditation, you do not gain access to, the, to this area. And then the other road, that is uh, Wabera Street on my uh, extreme left, you will see that uh, there is still another barricade that's uh, just controlling the access to, uh, to this area. But the security officers are, are, are present because even uh, as stretching to the other way of uh, the Kencom Road, you will see uh, that uh, the security officers, the horse riding uh, security officers are here to make sure that uh, there is no access to persons who should not be here. But essentially, uh, the business begins at 11 o'clock when the judges make their entry into the court and, of, of course, begin to hear the submissions in as far as the pretrial conference is concerned, as well as that uh, there are people who may have applied to be uh, enjoined in the case as interested parties. There are those who have applied to be enjoined as the friends of the court. So they will have their moment uh, before the court this morning, but of course they may not be heard by the judges because the directions have been that they need to apply, make their submissions in written format uh, so that the judges can peruse through and of course consider them and then they can give their ruling on who becomes enjoined in the case as a, as a friend of the court and who is enjoined as an interested party, Lillian. Before, before I let you go, um, you know, once again, just take us to um, what you were telling us as regards um, the court's itinerary. Unlike in August, like I earlier mentioned in my intro, um, where there was one petition, this time there are three, meaning that we're expecting to see more lawyers who will be arguing out their cases, and yet we have a strict timeline of exactly six days. Um, what are Kenyans expecting in terms of the court process now that we have more lawyers who will be arguing out their cases? Well, Lillian, we may not know for certainty what happens, but uh, borrowing from history, you remember that the Supreme Court petition, the presidential election petition in 2013, there were two cases, that is from uh, the court, that is Coalition for Reforms to Democracy at that time by Raila Odinga, as well as there was another petition by the Africa, the African um, Africa. So, uh, so, so the two cases were essentially, uh, what, what, what is the word? They were combined um, and were handled as one petition. But of course, when the judgment came, uh, the, the, the issues were specific to each of the cases. So we, we, we'll be waiting to see because of there are three cases. Will they be uh, collapsed into one case so that they can be handled as one? That is the, the more likely uh, issue to be taken by, by the judges because you realize that, as you said, just six days because there has to be a determination of the court by Monday. So how do they make sure that they're able to determine uh, these three cases by that time? So one, as I said, the most likely avenue for them to take is that um, they will be in a position to co collapse the, the three cases and hear them jointly uh, so that uh, if there are issues that are overlapping across the, th the three uh, petitions, that they can be handled uh, at the same time. But essentially, wh when, the, when the judges get here, their, their sole mandate, their main uh, agenda will be to determine who speaks when, for how long, because you realize that in August, we had one petitioner, that is the National Super Alliance, uh, led by Raila Odinga and Kalonzo Musioka. Uh, so the petitioner at that time got three hours, and then the, the, the respondents got three hours each. Then for the interested parties in the, the amicus curia got about 20 minutes per person. Uh, so this time round, how much time will be allocated each of the parties? Uh, so you will be expecting to hear 
uh, how much how much time is, is allocated each of the petitioners because there are three, uh, so they, they, they will be more constrained. But also depending on the number of issues that are before the judges for determination, will there be a request for scrutiny uh, of the servers? Will, be a, will, be a, will there be a request for scrutiny of the results declaration forms that is form 34 A's, form 34 B's, form 34 C's, like it was in August? So depending on the issues, because depending on the pleadings, depending on the prayers of the different parties, that will be the key to determining how much time is allocated to each person uh, to be in a position to hear the matter at most for two days because um, looking at the schedule, it remains so much consistent from what we had in, in August during the, that petition by Rello Dinga. Uh, so the expectation would be that um, uh, there should be a, s somehow a replication of the timetable, but of course that is up to the judges to determine alongside, uh, assisted by uh, the parties to this particular matter. Lillian? Thanks for that. Sam will be coming back to you for an update. Um, once again, all eyes on the Supreme Court judges um, who will this morning start a race against time hearing and determining three petitions filed in relation to the October 26th repeat presidential election. And we are awaiting the arrival of the Supreme Court judges um, and will be live there. Sam Gituku following up on events as they unfold at the Supreme Court and we will be going live there once again as we are await the arrival of the judges. Remember, this is the second time in only three months that the judges are being called upon to determine the validity of a presidential election and therefore all eyes on the Supreme Court once again. Let's cross over to Kisumu County where Laura Cheng is on standby. Want to get reactions from the ground, Laura, on the fact that the Supreme Court is once again expected to determine the validity of the just concluded repeat presidential election and also curious about what their thoughts are um, as regards the People's Assembly initiative. Let's um, hear from your end on what the mood on the ground is, what people are saying. Well, thank you very much, Lee, and a good morning to you back at the communication center. And here in Kisumu, well, that breakdown first by Sam Gituku, I must say, is very detailed and comprehensive. They are bringing, just shedding more light on that case. And now here in Kisumu, also on the corridors of justice, we do have some action going down. As yesterday, a warrant of arrest was issued against a former governor, former deputy governor, Ruth Odinga, and the current senator, Fred Outa, for, a file, uh, for failing to appear yesterday for a mention of a case filed against them last month, which basically uh, associates them with some the, the, the disruption rather of an IBC meeting sometime last month at the Prosperity House. Now we understand that, that the mentioning of that case has been pushed to 10 because the senator is there but uh, the former Deputy Governor Ruth Odinga is yet to appear. And also on the, on the matters of the formation of the People's Assembly today in the afternoon Kisumu County will also be joining its four counterparts along the Western and Nyanza Belt in tabling that motion. Now we understand that four counties so far have passed that motion that is Vihiga, Busia, Siaya and Homa Bay, which all passed that motion last week. And of course, we ex uh, there it's expected that the respective governors of those counties will be signing that into law. And here in Kisumu in the afternoon, we expect that motion to be tabled uh, as uh, the MCAs at earlier say that they're going to do that as their first agenda of business when they resume their sittings today. Last week, the entire week, they're on recess, but they'll be resuming their sittings today. Also in Kakamega, that uh, motion is expected to be tabled today. But among the issues that are the, that is captured in that motion as we were given by the senator include quite a number of issues but all of course in the same line that in what is being echoed by nasa in that include the reforms in the executive and water view and here with me also maybe just uh, to talk to the people of kisumu concerning the uh, presidential petition that is filed in the supreme court uh to mba took on only six days for the court to sit down and hear and determine uh, the outcome of this petition matter you have come on and again of course, uh, the way the Supreme did last time is what we are expecting from them. Because the election was uh, mayor with the multi practices. According to us, the people of Nyanza and the whole of the Kenya, we didn't vote for any person. That's why we are telling the Kenyans that October, no election. We didn't do any election tax place in Kenya. And we are expecting the court to nullify the way it nullified the last uh, 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 presidential election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The formation of People's Assembly County Leo motion Kisha Hali Katika Hali Formation of People's Assembly. Okay, Katika People's Assembly, Mimi Natarajia Kama Hapa Kisumu, automatically motion it will going to pass away. 
So I'm expecting the county assembly members, the MCS, to be sober and pass the motion. Yeah. Okay. okay, concerning the Supreme Court, of course the election was not good. It was not credible. And even all the Kenyans knew that the elections were not good. It was not credible. So I expect the CJ and the other judges to be sober in court and nullify the election. It was not done according to the law. Yeah. So, Asante sana. Well, Lillian, those are some of the sentiments of the people here. And, uh, Mze, yes. una, 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 una jiamini sana kuwa mtanashati wa vitu vya sheria sheria. Sasa, uh, ili, ili, ili uh, presidential petition, mauni yako ni epunona kama ita, ita FKV? Yes, well, my name is Charles Odwar. I think it is well uh, if court uh, nullify this election because uh, election uh, which uh, people done in 2016, in, 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 on 2016, it's not free and fair election and we are request the supreme court they can uh, sit down and uh, they nullify this election out so we can have a fresh election because people need what they want we are not uh, going to allow this election to president uru kenyatta to be sworn in with this election on 26. <laughs> And uh, maybe just one last person, Lillian. Uh, this whole thing, yeah, elections to uh, the Kura, Utulianza, Kupiga, Agas, Sukayenda, Kotini, it was nullified, and now we are back again to the Supreme Court. How do you think has Io Io Ime, Ime impact the, the general life of the common man? Yes, I'm William from Kisumu. What, can, what I can say to Supreme Court, first and foremost, you want. Uh, truth justice in this country and uh, secondly I say Mr. Uru Kenyatta cannot be swearing in as a president of the Republic of Kenya because election was not done in a free and fair credible now how, how has that affected your life as a monanchi in Kisumu how has that your the whole process how has it affected your life as a monanchi in Kisumu how? Well, uh, well, as a Kenyan citizen, that uh, election issues, I'm a businessman, it's affecting me because I wish that election would uh, go free and fair. We as a businessman, we have not been affected. But the but because election was not free and fair, so elect that uh, nini. What you talk about, but that, I, that well, Lillian, uh, that is one of the businessmen here in Kisumu, of course. Now six days is the, is the timeline we have for the for, for the determination of that petition. But of course, here in Kisumu, people are waiting to see how that will be playing out uh, within the six days, and of course, also in the corridors of justice, what will be happening to the senator and the former deputy governor. And that is in a nutshell what is going down here in Kisumu County. All eyes are back on the Supreme Court. Back to you, Lillian. Thanks for that. That's Laura Aching um, coming to us live from Kisumu County. We've been getting reactions from residents there um, on the Supreme Court, um, which is expected to uh, once again uh, hear petitions um, that are challenging the um, repeat presidential election. That's the October 26th repeat presidential election. We will be once again talking to Sam Gitsuku for the latest. He's live at the Supreme Court here in Nairobi County. Before that, we're crossing over to Nyeri uh, County where our man on the ground is Martin Munene. He's currently at Mathira constituency. He will be talking to the area MP Rigathi Gashagwa. Of course, all eyes, uh, Martin, on the Supreme Court and we're getting reactions uh, from different parts on the, of the country as regards people's expectations of following um, uh, the Supreme Court's uh, sittings once again uh, to determine the validity of uh, this just concluded repeat presidential election. Martin? All right, a very good morning to you, Lillian, from Nyeri County. And like you said, specifically for
from Madera constituency just a day after Nyeri County witnessed the swearing-in of its fourth governor who of course took over following the tragic death of the third governor Dr. Wahome Gakuru and uh, uh, of course in the swearing-in yesterday we saw of course local politics taking center stage uh, with a lot of leaders uh, in fact all leaders calling uh, for unity and uh, the fact that there is need for the county to come together and move forward but at the same venue I must say that national politics also took center stage uh, of course considering the fact that today uh, like you said activities at the Supreme Court the second time in a few months that the judges are being tasked with the responsibility of determining uh, how val or the validity of an election uh, and so uh, one of the people who attended uh, that particular um, swearing in and actually also talked about issues uh, of national politics is our uh, area MP Rigadi Gashagwa uh, who I'm with this morning and is just going to give us a feel uh, his personal feel but also his feel as a member of parliament and also as a leader in Mount Kenya region concerning what is happening in the Supreme Court and also other issues like the People's Assembly so Mheshimua kindly if you can join me here um, and, and, and maybe just just to start us off, uh, let us just start off locally. Uh, what is your take uh, on what happened yesterday? We actually did see that, uh, that we expected a number of governors to attend. We did not see any coming. And also you leaders were calling uh, for unity. What is happening? Uh, thank you very much. I think yesterday we had a very smooth transition uh, in accordance with the constitution where the deputy governor has taken over for the remainder of the term and uh, we were all there as local leaders to give support you know this county has had very many difficulties and uh, it is imperative that we as leaders now come together and uh, in a very united approach uh, focus on development so that this county can move forward uh, of course we are very saddened by the loss of dr gakuru but uh, as it may life must move on and uh, we have asked the new governor as soon as we have uh, escorted dr gakuru to settle down to work and get into serious business and uh, as i said yesterday uh, it is very good for him because unlike the previous two governors who had a very very difficult time with the county assembly who had a difficult time with the members of parliament this time round the members of parliament we are united we are supporting the governor the county assembly is very very supportive so the governor would have no reason not to deliver he has to sit down and start delivering and just move forward yeah, yeah. Uh, and maybe on matters uh, that are affecting the nation. Yes. Today, uh, we are at the Supreme Court. The judge is expected to be arriving uh, any time from now. Uh, what is your take on the fact that this is the second time in three months that uh, the judges are determining the validity of an election in Kenya? Yeah, I think um, we are asking the judges of the Supreme Court to take judicial notice of the mood in this country. Uh, the people of this country are having election on young fatigue. You know very well, Munene, we have been on the campaign trail for the last one year. The people of this country spoke very decisively on the 8th of August on whom they wanted to be their president, and they gave President Uhuru Kenyatta 8.2 million votes. And the judges of the Supreme Court disregarded what the people of Kenya had decided and looked at the processes. And uh, that is why we even amended the law in Parliament to say that uh, in any election petition, we would want the judges to look at the will of the people. Is there any problem with the process that would affect the outcome of what the people wanted? On the 26th uh, of this month, the people of Kenya once more, tired as they were, went back to the ballot and 7.4 million Kenyans decided once more, confirmed that they wanted the Kenyatta to be the president of this country. We are pleading with the, with the Supreme Court to really consider the will of the Kenyan people and to know that this country needs to move forward. This country, the economy has slammed down. Nothing is moving on. There's a lot of uncertainty. Investors are unwilling to come to this country because they don't know what is happening. The Supreme Court, Court judges are also Kenyans. And they live in Kenya. They know the environment in this country. And uh, it is upon them to uphold the will of the people by letting the people decide whom they want their president to be. And the people spoke and spoke very decisively. So we from this part of Kenya, the central region, as I said yesterday, our expectation from the Supreme Court is only one. We want a verdict to confirm that President Kenyatta was validly elected on the 26th of August and clear the way for his swearing in so that he can be sworn in and move on with the work 
that needs to be done in this country for the next five years. That is our plea from this part of Kenya. Yeah. All right. And of course, uh, uh, in a court of law, anything can happen. What happens if your wishes or, or the wishes of people of this region do not happen and uh, this election is thrown out? What happens? We want to be very clear, uh, Monene, from this part of Kenya. And we are clear. The people of this region are not prepared to go for another presidential election in the next five years. We have voted for President Kenyatta three times. For me, four times because I voted for him in 2002. And uh, we are done with the presidential election. The next time we want to participate in another election for the president is 2022, when the people of this region want to vote for William Ruto as president. We are asking the Supreme Court to know and to take note that they should not throw this country to the dogs. Ordering another election is a respectful disaster because the people of this country more specifically for the Muslim region, we are not going for another election. And we'll be able to take the consequences, whatever they are. Because uh, you cannot ask people to keep on going for elections. They go and make a decision, then you come and overturn it. So I'm... I'm Apologies for that poor signal. We'll be going back to Nyeri County as Martin Munene engages the area MP um, in Mathira constituency. That is Rigathi Gashagwa. Um, we're hearing from him, um, of course, following the Supreme Court, um, from, um, which is expected to formally begin hearings of a case challenging President Uhuru Kenyatta's re-election. Um, three petitions contesting the outcome of last month's election in which Kenyatta was declared the winner have been filed at the highest court by businessman Harun Mao and two activists. And today, Attorney General, yesterday, Attorney General Githu Muigai formally sought to be enjoined in the petition as Jackie Maribe reports. Beginning tomorrow, all eyes will be on the Supreme Court bench chaired by Chief Justice David Maraga with a pre-trial conference on presidential petitions scheduled for 11 a.m. The date and time confirmed by the hand of the Supreme Court Registrar in a notice issued today. Beginning the process of the Supreme Court's hearing and determination of the petitions challenging President Uhuru Kenyatta's election victory as well as a petition seeking to have opposition leader Rilo Dinga held in contempt of court. Today, Attorney General Githumuigai filing his application to be enjoined as a friend or the court or amicus curiae. In the Moore petition, the AG's center of focus being whether nomination is a mandatory procedural requirement in a fresh presidential election, which in his opinion is not. Basing it on the 2013 determination by the Supreme Court and the High Court decision admitting Third Way Alliance presidential candidate Dr. Ekuru Aukot. In the petition by Njonjomu and Khalef Khalifa, the AG argues that to the extent that the petition is premised on allegations of impropriety against the national government, the same is manifestly without merit and should be dismissed. The AG also wants the recently gazetted electoral laws to be applied in the Supreme Court's determination of the petition. But John Jomwe believes they have established a case to warrant the invalidation of President Kenyatta's poll victory. In an 82-point submission, Mwe claims IEBC failed to satisfy its statutory and constitutional obligations by not conducting the fresh election in all 290 constituencies. Mwe also claims to have additional tangible evidence against IBC Chair Fula Chibukati, alleging he lacked independence and the impartiality needed to conduct a free and fair poll. The petitioning and defending teams have assembled a galaxy of top lawyers who are expected to lock horns in legal duels for the next week. It will be the third petition disputing President Kenyatta's election by his chief political nemesis. That story was filed by Jackie Maribe last night as 
we await uh, the Supreme Court uh, to formally begin the hearing of a case challenging President Uhuru Kenyatta's re-election. And uh, we are live at the Supreme Court as we await the arrival of the Supreme Court judges. All eyes are on them once again. And we will be waiting, awaiting the outcome of the Supreme Court's decision on the repeat presidential election petitions. There are three of them this time round. And it is once again um, going to be um, a determining point for the nation as we await the outcome of the Supreme Court's decision. Sam Gitoko will be live there as we await the arrival of the judges. He mentioned earlier that they are expected to be seated by around 11 a.m. this morning and we will be crossing over there as we continue with um, the latest on the Supreme Court who have exactly six days um, to determine um, three petition filed in relation to the October 26th repeat presidential election. My guest in studio this morning, Steve Ogola. He's an advocate. We're also joined by Alu Talala Mohwana, who is also an advocate. As we look at the issues for determination by the three parties, let's begin with you, uh, Stephen, on what you expect the judges to be putting into consideration this time around. Uh, thanks, Lillian. Um this time, one of the critical aspects that the court must examine uh, inescapably must be the issue of public interest because it has been uh, highlighted significantly by, uh, interestingly, by both sides because the petitioners are arguing that public interest requires that the Constitution be upheld, be interpreted and upheld as was intended to be. So meaning you don't give people a sham election. Uh, but the other side of public interest is that we've spent, uh, being, being argued by the respondents, if you peruse the, the responses by, by Jubilee, by Huru Kenyatta and IBC, they're saying that public interest means already 14 billion has been sunk into the elections. And really, we have to reach a level where we can say stop. Uh, let's deal with the challenges going forward, but election must be preserved. So that is, that is one critical aspect of, uh, that will, ask, will, will significantly affect how the judges process these questions before them. There is also the other question about uh, the, the unnerving political environment, because this time the judges are making a decision in a very poisonous and toxic political environment. Already there are significant indications from both Jubilee and NASA that they are able to operate beyond the rule of law and that they don't care necessarily about this judgment if it does not deliver what they want. You just watched from that clip from um, uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament for Madeira, uh -huh. saying that Jubilee is not prepared to go to another election. That's a very significant statement, but it's also consistent with the narrative that Jubilee has been saying that they are tired of the election and this, uh, this Supreme Court judgment should only affirm Uhuru's. But on the other hand, we've also seen NASA stating that the, what, whatever, is going, go, whatever is going on at the Supreme Court should not launder the outcome of a flawed election, election where did not participate, and if the outcome is not nullification, they have programs and activities that will go on. In fact, what is today, in today's most papers, is that preparations are underway to receive Raila in a, in a grand reception, and is expected to sort of drum up the support for the way forward for NASA. So, the political context, the toxic, poisonous political environment will also weigh in, the public interest will weigh in, then overall, the court will also have to assess whether IEBC, in fact, has the ability to learn from this court. Because if the court is of the view that IEBC is, um, let's say, maybe for lack of a better word, let's say, has a rebellious and unrepentant attitude that is unable to take heed of what the court is saying, then the court must wonder, if you cancel this election, elect the, the third presidential election can only again be conducted by the same IEBC. The Constitution has limitations. There's significant limitation concerning IBC that you can't reconstitute IBC within 60 days and deliver an election. Mm -hmm. So I think all these issues, this th these three broad issues, the issue of the political environment, IBC's attitude to what the court said, and also generally the public interest, which is being framed depending on which lenses you're wearing, mm -hmm. will ultimately affect the court's view even before they start looking at the merits of the case. Mm -hmm. That's my view. Um, do you agree with uh, Steve, and particularly on the issue of public interest? We do know that public interest holds the view that there will never be perfect elections, and therefore, do you see the court putting this into consideration? For you, what are the key areas that um, you think the court will be putting into consideration? Uh, thanks, Lillian. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, f for me, uh, today, my younger brother has, uh, has, has said it well, uh, although he has surprised me a bit when he's, he talks. <laughs> he seems to... <laughs> 
to say <laughs> so the public interest will weigh in more. Uh, but, but we'll come to that. First and foremost, Lillian, uh, for me, where we begin is this same Supreme Court on the 1st of September made a decision. Mm -hmm. We are back to the Supreme Court because apparently something didn't work. So for me, mm -hmm. the first and major consideration by the Supreme Court must be when you guys were here, we made a ruling. Did you comply? Mm -hmm. So for me, the crux of the matter on what decision the Supreme Court decision must anchor is the substratum of their ruling. Was it complied with or was it not complied with? Indeed, if you look at those petitions, they seem to be saying, actually, Harun Maus, saying that, look, this IEBC did not, in fact, comply with the Constitution and the law. Put it the other way around, he's saying that you ordered that IBC must comply with the Constitution and the law, and they did not. So for me, that must be the revisiting point. Mm -hmm. But I agree with my younger brother when he says that the Supreme Court also might have on its mind the political atmosphere in the country. Absolutely. Judges are ordinary mortals like you and I. And what happens around them clearly gets to their mind as well. Mm -hmm. What is the political situation in the country? Mm -hmm. We have a country that is poised and is hurtling to self-destruction right across the middle. The Supreme Court might be influenced by this. Two, uh, Wakili also mentions about public interest. This is a bit dicey, and he, he rightly uh, dissected it when he says that there are those on one side who hold it what public interest ought to be, and on the other side, what public interest ought to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Public interest is slippery because in the country as we are now, if you talk about public interest in the context of NASA, public interest will be that the IEBC and they'll drop in Jubilee and say, you conspire to defeat the dictates of the ruling of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Jubilee side, the public interest will be that, look, we did everything possible, we did our best, and in fact, we won. But most importantly, the country has spent so much money. Why don't you just uphold the fact that the election has been done and we move on? Indeed, that has been captured by the member of parliament of Madeira, mm -hmm. whom I, uh, who I was addressing. Okay. So Lillian, on the subject of public interest, that is a bit dicey. Right. However, if you allow me, I'm a bit, a bit skeptical about whether the Supreme Court as currently constituted not in terms of numbers, but in terms of their mental frame, will deliver the judgment purely on constitutional merit, purely on legal merit, given the politics that have played from 1st of September when the first decision was made to, to date. Could you be more specific when you say mental frame, what exactly are you alluding to? I say mental frame, Lillian, because as I've said here, the justices of the Supreme Court are mortals like you and I. Mm -hmm. They have their own fears, they have their own considerations, they have their own preferences and so forth. If I take you back to the decision of the minority on the day the judgment was delivered, Honorable Yoki Ndungu made a descending decision. If you looked at her demeanor and in fact some of her express words, it indicated that there was bile beginning to pile within the justices themselves. Mm -hmm. And indeed, one of the, uh, of the attorneys, attorney Gatia to be specific, caught on camera, said that the court is eating itself. That was unintentional because it was just captured intentionally. That then, Lillian, gives some of us the perception that a second round in the Supreme Court mm -hmm. may find a, a Supreme Court that is divided. Divided or exhausted, which is I, which? I would come to that. Yeah. Division, in the sense, of course, division has a way of tearing you mm -hmm. uh, apart and fatiguing you. Mm -hmm. The second worry that I have is after that decision was made, we have seen a couple of things. One is the politicians who have ganged up either side to throw words of intimidation towards the justices. How much they have been able to bear and understand this is a matter of conjecture. Number three, the shooting of 
Justice Philomena Mwilu's bodyguard, which says unresolved, mm -hmm. could send a message also, whichever way. And finally, the fact that we were unable to raise a quorum on the eve of the election. Kenyans have cast us passions mm -hmm. on the integrity, on the reasons. Finally, uh, Lillian, <coughs> if they are readers of history, justices have exposed themselves to danger in Africa. Benjamin Kiwanuka of Uganda bears witness. Mm -hmm. Um, and hold that thought, Alutalala, to you, Steve, and I'm borrowing from uh, what your learned friend um, mm. has spoken about here, the decision by the Supreme Court. This is the second time in just three months the judges are being called upon um, to determine the validity of this presidential election, um, which is a repeat one. So whether the decision by the Supreme Court this time round will be binding and also borrowing from what Alutalala spoke about there, the fact that politicians have shown us that they have the capacity to operate outside the law. Mm -hmm. Looking at this, this time round, the fact that once again all eyes are on the Supreme Court, how are we sure, how, yeah. how, how confident are we that this time round this decision mm -hmm. will be binding? Actually, Liran, there, there are two types of challenges. There are challenges that are internal to the judiciary and the Supreme Court, there are challenges that are external to it. The external to it that I've spoken to them includes the, 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 the poisonous political climate mm -hmm. uh, context in which this judgment has to be made. The, the, the public interest, and it depends on the kind of lenses you're wearing, because mm -hmm. public interest now shifts, keeps on shifting. Uh, and the part of Jubilee, as you've said, is about the 14 billion already spent in this election. And on the part of the petitioners, public interest means the preservation of the intention of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So then there is that, there's also so those external, external influences will, will play, but also the, the internal challenges, the judiciary, some of which the judiciary should deal with, and I hope that the Chief Justice can address some of them now during this pretrial conference before the, the hearing proper. The challenges that are internal to the judiciary are this. There's a question of perception that, that Dr. Altalala speaks about. The perception emerges from what happened on 25th of October. Uh, the, the Chief Justice, and I think he made a casual Pre presentation on where the judges were, mm -hmm. uh, and he said that um, all of us are aware about what happened to the DCJ, for instance, because the previous night she'd been, her bodyguard had been shot at, you know, and then our interpretation as members of the public was that that scared the DCJ. That's a, that's a significant development that demoralizes the Kenyan public, mm -hmm. you know, because the judges have sworn to defend the Constitution at all times without fear. So then if it becomes clear that you can threaten a judge and then they fail to turn up, that, 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 that exposes a significant weakness and then it's, it's, the people begin to doubt your ability to function independently. Mm -hmm. So then I think one way of uh, correcting that is for the Chief Justice to offer a detailed explanation where these judges were, the ones that were unable to, to come to court. I think also to be fair to the, to the, to the justices, uh, usually because the Supreme Court is a quoted court and uh, it was a holiday, it's possible that the, the judges, not knowing that they would, they'd have to sit the next day, had made arrangements. So that explanation, in the absence of that explanation, that is where now we have this deepening perception crisis. But then in, uh, another issue that is very much internal to the judiciary this time mm -hmm. will depend on how what they believe is the proper approach. Because you see, if you analyze the judgment of the 1st September, they took what, because the judges said, let justice be done even if the heavens may fall. They took a strict constitutional fidelity approach, what maybe in, in a proper technical term would be considered a historical, teleological, purposive interpretation of the Constitution, meaning seeking to compare and contradistinguish what was there in the old Constitution, mm -hmm. and then what, what is it that this new Constitution of 2010 seeks to change, and then breathing life into that, a purposive reading of the Constitution, breathing life into the intended meaning mm -hmm. and operationalization as far as the Constitution implicates election management. That is what they, that's why they said we are not going to, ex we can excuse anything, but we will not excuse openness, compliance, and competence. That was the summary of the, of, of the, of the first uh, September determination. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact is this, this time they can maintain that perception, that, 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 that legal philosophy, or they may themselves coming to court they actually have altered their, their, their philosophy. And if you take another philosophy that also says that you, you just take what lawyers call uh, a formalistic, legalistic, textualistic analysis, which just says 
the constitution and under article 146 have elections in in, in 60 days mm -hmm. elections must be conducted in 60 days that democracy cannot be brought into urgent maturation democracy is is a, is, is a long-term project mm -hmm. let us consolidate the gains that you've had at this level let the politicians deal with the problems outside the court that approach lillian may 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 favor preservation of the election outcome mm -hmm. because then and for them to move to that approach they'll have to assess critically and, and as, as, as professor toller says they must they must assess ibc's responsiveness to the determination of first if the court is frustrated if the court feels frustrated that ibc is unable to learn from it mm -hmm. because you see the thing is this ibc and even the candidates must be co-opted into that vision whatever the supreme court is seeing as the proper interpretation of the constitution they must co-opt everyone because the court comes at the tail end so when you have election management uh, role, role players that starts with the IBC as, this, as, as, as the person that is at the epicenter of election management, the institution that is at the epicenter of election management, you look at candidates, you look at the role of servers, you look at civil society, the conduct of voters, basically the whole, the media, in fact, everybody that has a critical role, to, including election oversight uh, agencies like, like the National Police Service, their conduct, you know, the, the office of the ombudsman, NCIC, every, everyone put together, all of them must be co-opted into the vision that the Supreme Court sees. If the Supreme Court is of the view that the Constitution has transitioned the country to a higher level, but everyone else has been left behind, this time sitting around, they might, they might reflect and say, you know what, well, our reading of the Constitution, we, we require a higher threshold in terms of compliance, mm -hmm. but look at our lived realities in this country. So they might be demoralized and say, you know what, looks like we are stuck in this place where we'll be cancelling election every other time how many times do we need to cancel will you cancel elections forever if they have that kind of uh, if they are dejected and demoralized they might say okay let us have a decent tie three three let political class go and deal with the problems out there so it's it's um i can just caution the uh, just just to down the petitioners this yeah. time although the way the petition is framed matches the, f the framing of the, of the first no, no, uh, September 1st determination requiring strict compliance with the law, but it's not for granted that the court will persist in that approach. The court may actually move from that based on the, on the lived realities. I would want to downplay the effect of uh, the threats and intimidation to judges. I believe the easier way is this. That's why if the CJ would give that assurance, the easier way would, would be this. If there is real threat, judges feel that they are under threat and they are being put under external pressure, to decide one way or another, nothing can be easy, even now, Lillian, for this justice, including the CJ, to turn, you know, as, by the time you become chief justice, you are an accomplished jurist, you have, you have your, your history and contribution to the, uh, to, to the de development of the law is well documented, nothing can, 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 can be easier than bowing out with grace and saying, no, 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 I can't make a determination in, in a space where I'm being, I'm being, I'm being I'm constrained, I'm being threatened, and all. but if they decide to sit, to sit and determine this petition, then they will have to take responsibility for the kind of outcome they make. Mm -hmm. And they and can't pass that to another person. Which brings me to the question, Dr. Lutalala, whether this is a political or legal issue. When you look at, um, for instance, both sides of the political divide, the NASA leader is pushing for an interim government, but is not explaining um, to the people or rather to NASA supporters how NASA expects to hold a repeat um, election. Jubilee, on the other hand, um, is defending this election in law because they were declared the winner, presumably. Um, and if the court were to nullify the election, would Jubilee accept this outcome? Is Jubilee ready for to go into a third election? So looking at whether this mm. really is a legal issue or whether there is need for dialogue for the both sides of the political divide to come together and put an end to the stalemate. Lillian, you've, you've, you've put a couple of issues together, but in all cases you've captured them right. you framed the question correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, it is a quasi-political, quasi-legal. In other words, it's both. The, the problem that you're facing in the country right now is both political and it's legal. You must also appreciate, Lillian, that law and politics do not coexist exclusively they indeed are mutual aren't politicians the ones who legislate laws for the country under the delegated sovereignty dictate therefore as i've said a couple of times even at the risk of sounding repetitive what will solve the stalemate is a political national dialogue 
and I'm waiting mm. for what their grace the bishops are coming up with. Mm. I've had the privilege to be associated with them in terms of exchanging ideas, and they've already come up with a national dialogue uh, a forum where they are going, that is going to be all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Lillian, we Kenyans have a big problem. Our big problem is we behave like warthogs. <laughs> we are hit here, we turn back, move a few steps, and turn the same direction, forgetting that we've just been hit there, and go back, hit again, and come back. We are where we are because issues were raised and they were not resolved. I have always said that if you want to prosper, even Lillian yourself, where you come from, if I take the analogy of a family, where you come from, if God has blessed you and you have an advantage in terms of economic prosperity, personal development, education, in our African setup, you must always look back to your kid brother and kid sister, hold her hand so that you can also improve her because you'll never know peace if you are the only prosperous one. And in this country, it's real. We are told, our brothers here in Kiambu, prosperous homes, but they rarely visit there. Why? Because of insecurity. Mm -hmm. Why is that insecurity? Because their brothers and sisters are not doing equally well and they're hungry. So every time our well-to-do brothers drive in, the villages have become toll stations. What am I saying? We must listen to each other. We may never agree, uh -huh. but we must never fail to listen to each other. Uh -huh. What we have now is only going to be solved by a political dialogue. Lillian, remember that regardless of what the Supreme Court will come up with, there will still be a problem. NASA has declared beforehand that whatever the court decides, they're not recognized. And okay. these are part of the threats that I'm mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. So even if justices, their justices in their good wisdom come up and say, the election be annulled. That will not solve the Jubilee problem. Mm -hmm. If they come and say the elections are not annulled, that will not solve the NASA problem. It is a political problem that the law alone cannot resolve. Right. And as we take a break, hold on to that thought. The NASA leader, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Dr. Alu Talala there has said, is pushing for an interim government irrespective of the outcome of the Supreme Court decision on the repeat presidential election. We'll be talking uh, about the People's Assembly very shortly. When we return uh, in the next hour, uh, we'll be talking about um, this motion that is anchored in Article 1 of the Constitution of Kenya. Even as we cross over to the Supreme Court, we are expecting the Supreme Court judge to be seated by around 11 a.m. Our man on the ground there is uh, Sam Gitsuku, and we will be getting an update from him as well. That is the Supreme Court. As you can see, the Supreme Court judges are not seated as yet, but we will be expecting them to be uh, making their way there anytime from 11 a.m. We are expecting uh, proceedings to begin. We are staying with this developing story on Citizen Extra. Stay with us. We'll be right back.